Welcome to Cycle Talk. In this episode, we test the radical side-by-side Yamaha YXZ1000R. We visit Walker again and check out some amazing steampunk-inspired machines. And there's lots more. Let's kick it off with From the Apex. KDM's 2017 Big Bore Adventure Bikes were recently launched to the Australian motorcycle media. The Cycle Talk was there to try them out. The 1090R is the most off-road focused of the bunch and is very capable in technical sections of dirt. The 1290R is still just as capable in the right hands, but our first impression is it's more suitable on an outback trip with heaps of dirt and reasonably technical off-road sections. The 1290S is more suitable for long stretches of road touring with some dirt thrown into the mix. Keep an eye out for the launch report on the Cycle Talk website. It's almost Isle of Man time and we can't wait. Norton's going to field an Australian team of Josh Brooks, the 2015 BSB champion, and David Johnson. Johnson's receiving the highly coveted number one plate for the Superbike and for the Senior TT races, while a Josh Brooks is back at the mountain for the first time in a couple of years. And the other eagerly awaited return is Guy Martin. He'll be riding a Honda this year after sitting it out for a little while. He had a little try at TV stardom, but nobody can understand a word he said. Ducati may have a new owner soon, with rumours that Volkswagen is set to sell the iconic motorcycle manufacturer to pay off the Dieselgate scandal. Now, Dieselgate was a few years ago now, and Volkswagen has until now said it's not going to sell Ducati or any of its brands in actual fact. But they've got a $26 billion bill to, to pay off, and that's uh, fines, loss of e- earnings, and lots of other things that they've suffered because of uh, an engineer or a group of engineers decided to make their diesels produce less pollution when they were being tested than when they were actually being used. And they got in a lot of trouble over that. Ducati, which they bought a number of years ago, worth up to $2 billion. So it won't make that big of a dent in 26 billion, but it's still a lot of money. Yamaha is rumored to be building MT-10 based Tracer. Now we've ridden the MT-07 Tracer recently and that test is coming out soon. But we've also ridden the MT-09 Tracer, which has been out for a while now. An MT-10 based Tracer would be very, very interesting because that's a really, really powerful motorcycle and it'd be an awful lot of fun as a, as a touring bike. And interestingly, the FJR 1300, Yamaha's big bore touring bike, hasn't been updated in some time And that style of bike is sort of a little bit out of fashion these days. We think an MT-10 based Tracer would be a lot of fun. And hopefully this rumor turns out to be true. Robert M. Persig, the author of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, passed away recently aged 88. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance isn't really about Zen or about motorcycle maintenance, but it is a really, really interesting book. I remember reading it many, many years ago. I'm not sure I understood it. However, I am convinced it helped make me the nutcase I am today. Not only that, it's still available free at your local library. There's a legendary story that Eddie Lawson used to save a front end washout by pushing down hard with his knee. And when he was asked about this, how often it happened, he'd say about once a lap. Check out this save that definitely uses some of those techniques that Eddie might have pioneered. Now, so that was Loris Baz showing us all how it's done. And I'm actually really happy when I'm sliding my knee, but if I ever did anything like that, I'd need new underwear. Mark Jacobsons has won these Wiley X sunglasses because he asked a really good question on our Q&A that we have on Facebook every Tuesday at 9 p.m. So he asked about rider assists and I answered that one uh, at the time. And you can win too. So these are the next pair of sunnies that are going to go. These are Wiley X branded Harley Davidson sunglasses. They're, the model is called the Tank. And they are a really great pair of sunglasses. So join me on Facebook at 9pm on Tuesdays. That's straight after the TV show goes to live to air on Aurora. And it's soon after it's available on YouTube or Facebook. So you can watch the episode and then join us on Facebook and ask some questions about that. If you've already got something that you think uh, you'd like to see uh, me answer, send that to feedback at cycletalk.com.au and we'll answer it on the day.
I'm here with Lance Turnley. We're here at the launch of the YXZ1000R SS SE. It's a special edition. It's the new 2017 model. It's got a lot of hot new features on it, and Lance is going to tell us all about them. Great, yeah. Uh, thanks, Nigel. Um, the YXZ SS SE um, is different to our previous model. Last year we released the YXZ1000R, and that was the only uh, ROV vehicle with a manual clutch and a five-speed sequential shift. So it's the only vehicle in the world that actually has that. The rest of them are CVT drives. Now we've updated it even more with more technology and released the SSSE, SS being for sport shift. So this actually has an auto clutch um, and paddle shift, five-speed paddle shift. It doesn't have a clutch pedal. So that's why it's so much easier to drive. And there's some great Yamaha technology in there um, that allows you to do flat shifting. With this particular model, and it's exclusive to the SSSE model, is the Fox Podium 2.5 shocks and they have high and low speed dampening and rebound. Uh, so you, you can't actually get this uh, suspension with any other model, any other make of ROV. And the great thing about it is it allows you to be able to be comfortable at low speeds, but then it actually comes into its own at high speeds and really soaks up the bumps. The other thing about this unit, because it's an auto clutch, uh, it has launch controls. You hold in both paddles, you get the revs above 5,000, launch control engages, and then you put your foot flat to the floor and let the paddles go, and it absolutely launches the vehicle forward. It's fantastic. So, it's obviously built as a racer, but it's a lot more versatile than that. Because it being auto, it's easier to drive, and it's really popular with people who want to uh, do car carnas, if they want to do a little bit of competition, right through to um, doing the Fink. And there's cam, spec, roll cages and equipment, seats and all that sort of thing available for this unit. And you can go racing for a fraction of the cost that you would in a normal off-road buggy. And um, I believe you're getting a lot of interest from um from farmers that, that are having trouble getting normal um, ROVs across across rough terrain, people that need to travel faster, uh, hunters, shooters, people like that. Farmers don't want to be stuck out in the bush yeah. with a broken rubber band and they're going for this model because it's a direct drive um, and there's no chance of breaking anything. It wouldn't be that they just want to have a lot more fun. There could be a bit of that too. <laughs> <laughs> We're finding that a lot of farmers actually uh, don't mind uh, you know, driving a little bit quicker. Um, so, and there's no reason why, uh, just because they use it in their, um, you know, day-to-day -day work, um, that they don't want to just uh, have a bit of fun on the weekend. Yeah. You so, know. for that reason, you've got some accessories available to make it a little bit more utility. There's yeah, a box on this one, and yeah. yeah. So this one was this particular one was our adventure pack. We put in some uh, full harness seat belts for this particular day, and we also it has a. Uh, a luggage box in the back that you could put anything from fishing gear to hunting gear to um, just any gear that you Fencing have. If, gear yeah, or whatever they need. To do. Yeah, and you can just um, you know basically just go exploring. So you know what we've done today is that we've got a flat track, which is um, you know you can do speedway stop, sorry speedway style racing in it. We've got a natural terrain motocross track, which is the most popular with people. But we've also got a trail loop, and you can see how see how easy it is to drive and manoeuvrable in a tight trail. Yeah, yeah. No, it's been a lot of fun today. The machine is really, really capable. I mean, I still think the best way to get through the bush is, you know, if it's going to be a Yamaha, it's going to be a WR250F for me, or a WR450F if you're better in the dirt. But if you do need four wheels, if you do need to carry a passenger, if you do need to carry a load, I can see a lot of reasons why you'd want to have a good look at one of these new, uh, new machines from Yamaha. Cycle Talk is much more than just a TV show. Download our digital magazine or pick up the print version from Better Australian Bike Shops today. We produce the best road, dirt and ATV tests. 
Every issue features great reading from our columnists, and there are products, letters, and lots more. There are apps for the iPad and the iPhone. You can download over five years' worth of our monthly magazine, read it online, or download to your PC, Mac, or Android device. Check out cycletalk.com.au for lots more information. Get involved with Cycle Talk on our Facebook page and get our videos directly in your YouTube feed by subscribing there. This feature is brought to you by Spitty on track. Now you think Walker would just be the gateway to some amazing roads and some farming, but it's a great little artist shop, I guess. It's called the Antipodean Tinker. And this uh, shop in the, in the main street of Walker is, uh, is the home of uh, Mark Walker. And, and what he does, he, he takes other people's junk and turns it into some amazing art. And if you think steampunk, this is all in here. He's built some amazing bikes that they just look like art, but they actually run. So let's go inside and have a look. Um, well, this is Big Ned, the ultimate street fighter. And Ned is a three litre rotary valve and he has twin rear chain drive and the rims are car rims that have been cut in half and then uh, we have leather covered over the spokes and the fire extinguisher are uh, used for the exhaust and uh, Ned was inspired by a visit to, that Mark had to a gallery in Canberra uh, to see Sidney Nolan's versions of Ned Kelly, the square heads uh, that's why Ned actually has square heads. Um, this is the first bike that Mark has built in the four bikes that you see here. And prior to, to building Ned, he built in 1970s a top fuel drag bike, the whole bike and the whole engine. And Mark kept that bike on the track for 30 years. And uh, changing it over that time, developing it and also changing with the ruling um, during that period and so at the end of that time he decided to throw you know that he'd had enough uh, he didn't need to do it anymore and so he wanted to start building work for himself and so that's where he started with Ned uh, and uh, the the, the MW Special, which was that top fuel drag bike, is out at Mount Panorama now on display in the, in the museum. The Abyss Rider is the latest bike that Mark's built, and it's a 200cc straight eight rotary valve, a Dunstan type rotary. And the inspiration for this build was a scooter that Mark actually put together from a basket case and uses as his roadie, but he doesn't leave the 50k zone. And uh, so he decided that he would build his own scooter. And this bike is called the Abyss Rider, the final ride, and it's for Mark's final ride into the Abyss. And it's a very much a steampunk bike. It's a lot of black chrome and copper and uh, lots of found object. Uh, we did have this bike running in uh, winter last year and uh, this, this is the tiniest bike that Mark's built. Smallest pistons, sounds awesome, R really a grumbly little motor. The Solster is a 1000cc rotary valve and it is a boltless construction. The head screw into the barrel. Uh, this bike was inspired by board track racing in the 1920s and particularly inspired by Alessandro Enzani's designs on the board track. And he's also using a Mitsubishi Magnetos on this bike that uh, came from a previous, uh, actually off the V-twin I think at one stage. Uh, the block of aluminium that Mark used on this bike it was actually on a scrap pile. A guy had drilled all the holes in the wrong places uh, and so Mark not only created his own engine but has created it around uh, holes that were drilled in the wrong places. You can see actually some of the, the you know, these marks here. Uh, are actually, and also why he did twin rotors was another reason that um, uh, because of this block. 
This one he calls the 1916 because Mark is really uh, interested in that era. He really feels, you know, that's that's the era that most feels good to him. Uh, so, and it also is a V16. He's created over 12 months the crank for this bike and uh, then he built a prototype and we also had a wooden model built of a V16 uh, and to work out you know how he was going to go about it. Um, from building the prototype he's decided then to instead of remachining 16 heads uh, which he'd still be doing. He's remachined flywheel, conrod, barrel, head and piston from Victor 160s because this is a found object bike. And he uh, also has used a Suzuki clutch, Rover bevel gears. There's lots of plumbing fittings on here. He's used a shower head for the air intake and fire extinguisher fuel tank. So it very is, this is a supercharged two-stroke. So very much, um, uh, we didn't really realise it at the time, but uh, apparently it's in the steampunk world. So I think we were there all along, but um, very beautiful. Mm. This product review is brought to you by Avon Tyres. This is the Ace Bikes Steady Stand. Now it's a, a paddock stand for, a, for the front wheel. So you roll your front wheel into it, like so, and it essentially locks the bike in place. So the bike can't move around too much while you're working on it um, or while you're storing it. And if you've got it in the trailer or in your van, um, it'll also hold the bike a lot steadier than just using tie downs. So you still need to use tie downs, but it'll do a good job. There's a strap here at the front, which can go around to give it a bit more stability and hold it in place. And it's got nice rubber feet so it doesn't slide around once the uh, bike is, is in place. It's got a handle on the top so it's easy enough to carry around and move around. And I think these are a, a fantastic accessory for any motorcyclist um, that has the right size front wheel. So this is one's designed for multiple size wheels just by moving this bracket into these holes. So that one's set up for a 17, but it can take up to a 19 inch front wheel. Um, very handy, very useful, and um, a great thing for just about every motorcycle to have in the shed. This is the Ace Bikes Steady Stand Cross. It's designed for motocross or enduro uh, front wheels to lock the bike into place when, you're, when it's in your van or bolted onto your trailer. So you pre-configure it to suit your front wheel and then when you roll that in, it drops into place and then this pedal, you push down on that to effectively clamp it in and that clamps the front wheel. By doing that, the bike can't fall over very easily at all. So you don't need to then put a lot of strain on your suspension with tie downs. Uh, so your suspension isn't put under a lot of pressure and the bike is very, very steady. An extra bonus, it's very easy to load uh, and once you just roll it in and once it drops in, you can almost let go of it then. To get the bike out, it's the reverse. You just release the, the, uh, the latch here with the bottom of your foot, throw that up. That takes most of the pressure off. Then you just roll the bike out and you're, uh, and you're done. Now up here, you can adjust this to suit 18 or 19 inch front wheels with, uh, with it positioned where it is now. Or you can move it forward a little bit to go 21 inch front wheels. Uh, it comes with all the fitting gear you need to bolt it into your trailer or your van. And it's made out of very heavy duty steel. Uh, it really does feel like it'll last forever. Um, and it really feels like it will hold your bike in place without any drama at all. So the main advantages again, makes it easier to load and unload, um, holds it more securely and takes all that pressure off your suspension. Uh, we really like the, uh, the steady stand and I'm wondering if there's a way we can uh, ditch the generic ramps in our trailer and replace it with one of these. This product review is brought to you by Wiley X, absolute premium protection. I'm here with Lance Turnley. Now Lance is with Yamaha but as part of an industry initiative uh, they've been working with, uh, the shark, with shark helmets in, uh, in France uh, through their uh, distributor, Faceda 
to come up with a helmet that's far more suitable for ATVs and UTVs than the existing helmets and, and addressing the concerns and the issues that a lot of um, uh, people on the, on the land have with using conventional helmets. So Lance, tell us a little bit about what you've been developing and why. Well, you know, over the last few years there's been a lot of ATV fatalities and 30% of those at least could have been avoided if the riders were wearing a helmet. And a helmet is, is a proven safety device um, on an ATV or an ROV for that matter. So the industry got together and surveyed uh, farmers and uh, users at farm shows and uh, to find out why they weren't wearing helmets. Four main reasons that we found was that the helmet for them is too hot or it's too heavy or the doing up the buckle is, is cumbersome and also that they can't hear the stock or their dogs when they're mustering. So, um, you know, they want, they, that was the reason why they, they, main reasons why they wouldn't wear a helmet. Okay, so the four features about this helmet is that it's lightweight. It's a full fiberglass composite shell and it's also gel coated, so it's resistant to UV radiation. In the top of the helmet, we've got six large holes that can be opened and closed to allow airflow at low speed. It also has uh, a, a, a buckle system that makes it easy for the helm, helmet to be undone and uh, refastened easily. You know, when the, when the farmer wants to take it off and open and close gates. And finally, it has holes in the side here where um, it allows the farmer to be able to hear the stock and to uh, hear the dogs when they're mustering. So that covers the four main things that the, um, that the were concerns for the farmers. The other thing is that it has four optional um, four optional packs. It has a sun pack, a dust pack, a fly pack and also a noise pack um, which is it basically allows you to adapt the helmet to whatever conditions you're in and it's fully um, uh, Bluetooth compatible with the shark tooth uh, system so there's a cavity here for the battery to go into and there's spaces there for the speakers to go into the to the earpieces. It is all that and fully DOT and ECE approved. So you can use this the same as a motorcycle helmet and it has so many more other applications. Um, they're being produced in, uh, in uh, France at the moment and we hope to have them on the shelves in a couple of months. But there's the, one of the things about this helmet is that it's also full DOT and ECE approved. So you can use this the same as a motorcycle helmet. So it's also great for, for uh, farmers on ag bites, um, for um, people who have seen them and say it'd be great for snowboarding and a whole lot of, uh, you know, like equestrian events. So there's a whole lot of more applications for it, uh, particularly in the workplace. And um, uh, yeah, hopefully it's going to be very uh, available very soon. With the resurgence of rockabilly, everybody wants to get into the scene. They want to have the right clothes, the right tattoos. You've got to have the right bike too. Which one would you choose? Maybe one like this? First started off with bikes, I actually went to a scooter rally in San Francisco, California. That was the first time really um, that I thought it would be something that I'd be into. There were all these people on, you know, Vespas and Lambrettas and everyone was, you know, dressed in like the 60s style, and I just thought it was the coolest thing. When I moved to England, I thought I would get a scooter, because that's what I had been riding back in California, and I met a gang of girls that rode proper motorbikes, and uh, they basically encouraged me to not go for a scooter, but to actually buy, you know, a motorcycle, and so um, that's what I did. What I love about this bike is it's really simple. It's a 64 Bonneville motor in a 1970 frame, a rigid frame. It's got a lot of aftermarket kind of old school vintage parts. How does the bike ride? Well, um, it's definitely a hardtail. <laughs> so uh, I kind of forgot about it and I was riding here today and, you know, tooling along and, you know, all of a sudden you hit a big bump and it's like, woo! 
When I ride it, it is absolutely awesome. Uh, it's got straight pipes, um, so it's super loud. And even just riding it here, I mean, everyone was, you know, they can hear you coming up. <laughs> and it's, it's awesome. I love it. it. I love how it handles. I love how it's, how it's really low. It definitely has that grumble of a real old, cool, vintage bike. It's really cool to be here at Harry's. Uh, this was one of the very first places I came uh, on my bike, and I met up with a group of girls called the Foxy Fuelers. Uh, I did the first ride, it was for throttle roll with them, and uh, since then, that was a couple years ago. Motorcycling has kind of made me my family that I have today. Like, all my girlfriends over here are really um, from the motorcycling scene, so I think, yeah, it's, it's motorcycling is, is my family. So if you're going to live the rockabilly lifestyle and you're going to have all the accessories, this is the bike you want. It's the real deal.